Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 72 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman, I'm here every week. Uh, this week we're not joined by Ayaz Sumra, he's ill, so unfortunately he's not with us, but we've got a special guest to join us throughout the length of the show. It's a good friend of the show, it's a good friend of mine, it's of course Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing? I'm good my man, how about you? Yeah, hey, I'm I'm pretty good, man. So just before we jump into the show and we go like usual, I just wanted to ask you, how are things with you in your current situation? What is next for your career, for the fans, for the listeners, I should say? Well, basically at this point, I'm just trying to get my weight to a manageable, manageable spot so uh, I can compete at cruiser or fight smaller heavyweights. You know, I think it's, a, it's about that time to, uh, you know, get an opportunity to fight guys my size and stop wrestling with these monsters and these big giant guys for so you know, that I have, you know, that I've done for so many years. So that's basically where I'm at. I'm working on that and, you know, getting in some shape and uh, going to try my hand down there again. Brilliant stuff, Eddie. Right, so we're going to roll straight into part one. This part, of course, the review part where we review the fights from last weekend. So there's quite a lot to go over. Um, one fight I will mention that happened over in Russia. Uh, top of the bill over there, Dmitry Bivol. He's only 8-0. He was defending his interim WBA World Light Heavyweight title against uh, a guy called Robert Berridge, who I hadn't really heard much about, but Dimitri Bavol is a good prospect coming up. He actually recorded a TKO in round four, so he extends his winning record to 9-0, and and of course he retains that title. That's it for Russia. Going over now to Quebec, Canada. One fight on this bill that really captured my attention. Um, Alida Alvarez, really a fighter that... You know, has got a quite promising future in the light heavyweight division. He was 21 and 0, putting his well, his unbeaten record on the line. There was no silverware on the line against Lucian Boutte, who was moving up in weight from super middleweight. Uh, I actually said on last week's show that this was going to be an interesting fight. Lucian Boutte, even though his better days are behind him. He uh, he seems to be able to pull these good fights out of the bag. Um, you know, obviously he shouldn't have got a draw with Badu Jack. He should have lost that fight. But he gives good fights even when he loses. And I did say that if Alida Alvarez was able to stop him, that would be a marquee win and a real statement. And he was able to do that. He got him out of there in brutal fashion in round five. He recorded a TKO. So Alida Alvarez now 22-0 and and a serious, serious name for his record. Lucian Boutte now 32-4. and with the one draw, so it'd be interesting to see where he goes from here. But um, if I had to advise him myself, I think you know, possibly retirement for Lucian Bute. I know that's a little bit harsh. Moving over now to Norway in Oslo at the Spectrum, top of the bill over here, Cecilia Barakas, 29 and 0. She moved to 30 and 0 in this fight against Clara Svensson. Also, Cecilia Barakas had all of her belts on the line the WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO, and IBO World Welterweight titles. She won a 10 rounder. Of course, that's 10 two minute rounds. Uh, she won. Every round, I believe, on, on, on every judge's scorecard. So a shutout for her. But we will be speaking to her trainer very, very soon. If you don't know who that is, then definitely stay tuned. Uh, that's it for Norway. Moving over now for one fight in the UK at the Middleton Arena in Middleton, Lancashire. Uh, one fight to mention over here. Zelfa Flash Barrett moved to 15-0. and He picked up a KO in round three over Ronaldo Kajahina who uh, I probably haven't pronounced that right, but Kajahina was down twice in that third round, a uh, KO in that round for Zelfa Flash Barrett, so good stuff for him. Uh, that's it for Middleton. Moving over now to York Hall, the mecca of boxing in the UK. I'm not sure it's the mecca, but it's the home of boxing. Everybody's fought in York Hall in Bethnal Green, London. I was actually in attendance for this bill. Uh, a few fights to mention, really. I'm going to start with a fight on this card. Jay Harris moved to double figures, 10 and 0 now. He um, he actually defended. Oh no, sorry, he didn't defend. He won the Commonwealth flyweight title from Thomas Asomba, who had a record of 7 and 2. Thomas Asomba came to the ring 
wearing one of those um one of those african i'm not sure what they're called one of those african dresses uh with the hat it, it was real it was real cool it was it was quite a nice ring walk and um yeah but you know the business got done or well, the job got done on him by Jay Harris. Jay Harris was quite impressive there, but it was a bit of a war. Actually, you know, every time I go to York Hall, there's always one fight that's a bit of a war. There's one fight that, um, you know, seems to, even though it's maybe lower level fighters, you seem to get quite caught up in it. And that was the fight of the night for me. Uh, there was an upset on the bill as well. Craig Poxton TKO'd Boy Jones Jr. in the final round of their 10 rounder. Really unfortunate there for Boy Jones. Uh, he was down twice in that 10th round. The first one, he actually took a knee. I think it was the first one. It might have been the second one, I think he took a knee. So it was clever stuff, but his coach knew that that was it for him. And uh, they threw in the towel, I believe. I can't really remember too clearly. But uh, Poxton was also cut above the left eye in the 7th round. But again, he went and won. So so Poxton now 12 and 4, Boy Jones Jr. 11 and 1 with one draw. Archie Sharp was also on the bill as well. He picked up a TKO in round two. Good win for him. I like watching him fight. He's got a very exciting style. So he's now 7 and 0. Oh. It was a real good knockout as well. It really, really was a TKO in round two, as I said. Uh, Lerone Richards was also on the bill. He moved to 6-0 and with a points win over six rounds. He absolutely played with his opponent, to be honest. So uh, good to see from Lerone Richards, a promising prospect yet again. Uh, Sanjeev Sohota was also on the bill. He recorded a TKO in round two. It was only scheduled for six, but he didn't need the six. He moves to 6-0. and His opponent was also down in the first round, but I will note his opponent had over 100 losses. So a proper journeyman there, uh, Harley Ben. I've got, to, I've got, I've got to just say on Harley Ben. Uh, that's a son of 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 Nigel Ben. Obviously, he's got the two sons now, both boxing, Connor Ben and Harley Ben. Harley Ben is like he's a strange son. He doesn't want anything to do with his dad. It's quite, um, it's not very nice to see that. But Harley Ben came out on his pro debut. And I know that he's got kind of those big eyes like his dad. You know, he's got like those wide eyes. And, and I've got to say, I don't know if it was just because of the eyes he's got, but he looked so nervous. He looked like he was shaking. He was just a complete bag of nerves in the corner. When I saw him on the ring walk, he came through with his head down. Very negative energy around him. He got in the corner and um, he didn't, you know, he didn't really look at his opponent from from the minute that he got in the ring as soon as the fight started he came out all guns blazing just trying to get a stoppage he didn't want to box at all he just came out to have a fight it was as simple as that he couldn't wait to get his debut over with it really looked that way uh, he used up a lot of energy in that first round uh, he came out in the second round and he managed to score a TKO win uh, his opponent had a record of 2-2 two and two with one draw, so, you know, decent for his debut, but Harley Ben came out, and he was absolutely gassed to high heavens, and again, I don't think it's because of his fitness, I think it might have just drained him, the pressure, the nerves of the whole event, uh, being it his debut and all that, so I just think, for, for Harley Ben, he needs to calm down a little bit, as I say, he managed to get the TKO, but a lot of people at ringside feel that the referee done him a bit of a favour because he was looking extremely tired in that second round. But it's good to get his debut behind him. I had a little, a little, um, I sent him a little message on Twitter. He replied, and you know, he seems to have done pretty well with that win. And hopefully, we see him come again. We see him come a lot better than that and uh, less nervous, obviously. So Harley Ben now one and zero. Charlie Driscoll, this fighter, I do not know what it is. He, he moved to four and zero with a points win over four rounds this man pulls a crowd that you've not you've not seen i remember watching his debut uh, at york hall again and uh, the the crowd he brought there on his first fight was absolutely unreal and you've got people from all ages you've even got the you know the pensioners are in there making noise for him so that's great to see um zach Chelly was also on the bill he actually won a technical decision in the third round, it was only scheduled for four rounds. It was a bit of a strange one. Zach Chelly actually came out to the Sopranos theme tune. So as soon as I heard that, I was rooting for him to win. Um, his opponent was knocked down in the second round and cut above the eye, I believe, at some point during that fight. I think it was an, yeah, it was an accidental head clash. Uh, in the third round, and it was such a bad cut that they had to stop it and go to the scorecards, which he won a uh, technical decision, as I say, for, for Zach Chelly in the third round. Uh, that's it for York Hall, but it was a great, great bill. Thank you very much to Frank Warren for getting me 
getting me over there. Um, moving over now to the US at the Pechanga Resort and Casino in California, USA. Uh, one fight to mention or two fights to mention on this bill. Sal Rodriguez, 20-0 with one draw. He took on Oscar Bravo. It was a bit of a, it was going to be quite a test for Sal Rodriguez here. He was put down in the fifth round. He managed to get up off the canvas and win a split decision. It was only a 10-rounder. A lot of people are disputing this. A lot of people have took to Twitter to say that this is the wrong decision and that he was very, very lucky there. He was given a gift, Sal Rodriguez. i got to hold my hands up and say I didn't watch the fight. But, um, you know, to get up to get up off the canvas and win is, is a great thing. But I don't know if he, how fortunate he was. I'm not too sure. Andrew Tabiti was also on that card. He moved to 14-0. His opponent retired at the end of round six. He didn't want to come out for round seven. Uh, he was down in... Uh, that that sixth round as well, and he retired in the corner. So Andrew Tabiti now 14 and 0, a good win for him. Uh, that's it for the USA. Coming back to Dublin now in Ireland, one fight or two fights to mention here. Luke Keeler picked up a win with a points victory over eight rounds against Lewis Taylor. So Luke Keeler now 12 and 2. Uh, Steve Collins Jr. was also on that bill. He moved to double figures in terms of wins. He's got 10 wins, zero losses, and one draw. It was a points win over eight rounds at Cruiserweight, that one. Now coming over to the bill on Saturday. Last Saturday, of course, in the Ice Arena in Hull, Yorkshire. Top of the bill, Gavin McDonald, 16-0 and with two draws. He fought the undefeated Mexican Ray Vargas, 28-0 and with 22 knockouts. We didn't know too much about him. We had Dave Caldwell on the show, I think it was last week or the week before, talking about this fight. Um... Listen, we've got to say, Gavin McDonald's never fought at that level. It was for the vacant WBC World Super Bantamweight title. Ray Vargas was absolutely brilliant. He really was. Uh, I believe when I was watching the fight, I had it a little bit closer than the judges. Some people were saying that they didn't even give Gavin McDonald a round. I think that's a bit harsh. Um, for me, you know, he probably lost the, the fight maybe 8-4, to four, something like that. Um, but I, th I think he did pretty well towards the end of the fight. I think he started a little bit slow. Gavin McDonald, I'm talking about. Um, Ray Vargas definitely showed his class. But I've got to say, for all those knockouts and that that you know that kind of aura about him, where people were a bit frightened that he was such a banger, he didn't look to be the banger of the two. And I'm not saying Gavin McDonald looked to be the banger of the two. He, we know that he's a bit feather fisted. He's not a hard puncher, but he seemed to sort of. I don't know, I don't want to say worry Ray Vargas a bit more with his power, but he was landing the better shots at some points of the fight. Don't jump down my throat. At some points of the fight, he was doing pretty well. So, um, all credit to Gavin McDonald. Listen, he's one of the nicest guys in the sport of boxing. His record now 16-1. and one. It's such a shame that he's lost his unbeaten record. And, of course, a big chance at the world title there. So, Ray Vargas goes back to Mexico, the new WBC World Super Mantleweight Champion with a record of 29-0. and 0. It was a majority decision after 12 rounds, that fight, by the way. Also on that bill, Luke Campbell picked up a TKO in round two against Jairo Lopez, who had a record of 21-6. and 6. Uh, Luke Campbell 16 and 1 now his record Lopez was down in the first round as well so Luke Campbell retains his WBC silver lightweight title uh, really we want to see him stepping it up in all honesty uh, Tommy Coyle was also on the bill a good fight for him wow he took on Rakeem Noble who actually works um, for the trains in the UK he works on the platform I believe I don't think he drives trains I think he actually works on the platform he got his big chance on Sky Sports he stepped in there with a record of 11 and one. I don't think he had too much notice. Tommy Coyle uh, managed to pull out one of those thunder punches. It was a real big knockout. Uh, good start to the fight from Rakeem Noble, though. But it's a shame that he wasn't rewarded for it. So his record now 11 and two. Tommy Coyle 23 and four, and he's looking to get a shot at the British title next, which will be nice. Uh, Ryan Burnett was also on the bill. He moved to 16 and 0 with a points win over eight rounds. Uh, also on the bill, Dave Allen, a friend of yours actually, Eddie Chambers. He uh, he moved to 10 wins. Of course, he's got the two losses, albeit to Dillian White and Luis Ortiz. But he picked up a TKO in round one. I believe it only took him 31 seconds to knock this guy out. So a good win there for him, Eddie Chambers. I'm sure that you'd yeah. be uh, happy he got a win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I seen, I seen, um, I seen a little bit of it. I seen the uh, the clip of him. 
And um, I still say the same thing. I mean, I, I love the style that he brings to the table to a degree. I mean, he knows that I think he can box a lot more than he actually does. But he's definitely uh, on the right track. And in a sense, he got back on the winning side. Let's hope he continues. Yeah, absolutely. I echo that. Uh, moving over now to the Legacy Arena, Birmingham, Alabama, USA. I'm going to start with the undercard. Um, two fights I want to come to you about, Eddie, but just in a moment. Firstly, I want to talk about, well, in fact, all three. Did you watch the the uh, the main three fights? So the Wilder fight, the Brazil fight, and the Tony Harrison fight, Eddie, do you know? I watched the uh, Tony Harrison and, uh, and Jared Hurd, and then I watched Gerald and um, when Deontay Wilder go at, go at it, but I missed the uh, Brazil fight. I heard the Brazil fight was great, but I missed it. I heard it was an exciting one. I missed it. I, I, I kind of under. I got. A, I kind of got a play by play of what it was to a degree, but I didn't get a chance to watch it all. Okay, let me just jump in for the uh, the Dominic Brazil fight against his opponent Uga Noah. I'm just going to talk about that, and I'll come to you in a sec about the other two fights you said you watched. Firstly, Dominic Brazil. Um, I've knocked him in the past for having a bad gas tank. This this guy. Yuga Noah, I'm, I'm probably even saying his, his name wrong. I didn't know much about him. He ov- obviously, he came into the ring with a with a winning record, an unbeaten record, 17 and 0. Dominic Brazil, 17 and 1. Um, it was a fun field fight because Uga Noah was also, you know, he was down in round three. He was down twice, I believe, in round five, which was the final round of the fight. Brazil was down in round four. It was just basically a fight. There was not too much boxing skills involved. Um, I remember at the time watching it, uh, and I just remember thinking, this is crazy. I, he kind of... Uga Noah kind of put his punches together pretty well, because I didn't know much about him. He's he's like... Um, you know, he's actually representing Poland, but obviously I think his roots are from Africa. He came mm. into there with a kind of... He was doing the basics right, and I, people are going to think that I'm crazy, but I saw a bit of Joshua in him, and I mean that because Joshua loves to throw like the straight one-two, you know, straight down the pipe, mm-hmm. the, 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 you know, the, the jab and the straight, then the straight right, and he seemed to do that pretty well. And when he was doing that, he was hitting Brazil, so it kind of looked a little bit like uh, the Joshua Brazil fight, which was so one-sided. But this one, I've got to say, when Uganoa had Brazil down. I think he was ready to go. He was just completely mm-hmm. gone. And I think that Brazil, even though some people are giving him a lot of credit for getting up and winning, I think he was quite lucky, to be honest. I think, mm-hmm. I, I actually think Uganoa could have got up. I think that it was weird because when he got knocked down, the referee just kind of laid on top of him so he couldn't get up. <laughs> I've, I've got to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, enough about that fight. A good win, I suppose, on paper for Dominic Brazil, 18 and 1 now. There was a bit of an altercation after the fight, but I won't go into that because I don't really know the the full details, but there was some sort of bad altercation in, in the hotel foyer. Apparently, uh, Brazil's wife got choked by a member of Deontay Wilder's team. I don't really want to talk about that because, like I say, I don't know too much about it. But um, I'm going to throw it over to you now, Eddie, for the, uh, the this fight that you did watch. Jarrett Hurd, 19-0 and against Tony Harrison, 24-1. and It was for the vacant IBF World Super Welterweight title. Obviously, Harrison was knocked down in round nine where the fight was finished. Um, I'll just give my opinion first. Tony mm. Harrison was outboxing Jarrett Hurd. And, mm. and, and to a certain degree, I'd even go as far as schooling him a little bit in some mm-hmm. of those early rounds, um, making him look a little bit silly, a little bit one-dimensional. But as the fight went on, I think the conditioning, the uh, the strength, maybe the core strength of Jarrett Hurd seemed to take over, seemed to get him back in the fight. And of course, we know that he can bang as well. And Tony Harrison, not known for the best chin, mm-hmm. obviously you know, he was stopped in that round nine. So Eddie, what did you see from that fight? Well, you know, as I was watching it, you know, the first few rounds, the first... The initial uh, look that I got was that uh, Jared Hurd just wasn't fast enough. He was just a little bit too slow for him. Um, not enough sauce in his game. You know, like certain movements threw him off. You know, Tony Harrison was fighting behind the shoulder, really nice off the jab. You know, moved him, turned him a lot. And he really didn't have any answers early. But I kind of saw what was happening with it. And I saw that Jared Hurd was, you know, getting a little closer, hitting him to the body a little bit, hitting him on the arms kind of wearing him down and my thing is I know I know Tony man he's a he's a not only is he an extremely talented dude as far as a fighter but he's a really nice guy as well what I really would have loved to see him 
doing, it probably would have been better, in, obviously, in training. It would have been in training is the really – he's got to get stronger, you know, physically. I don't think it's so much his chin as it's him just not being strong, you know what I mean, not being physically strong. You know, when you see a guy, they're both about six foot one, but – Jared Hurd looked more menacing and more physically dominating, you know what I mean, in the fight, even though he was taking, I believe, I believe he was getting, like you said, schooled, you know what I mean, he was taking him to school, but the problem was, over time, and it, you know, it's, 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 not a, it's not a sprint, you know what I mean, it's more like a marathon, so, you know, he got, he was getting closer, he was getting closer and wearing him down, and I think eventually, when he landed, uh, you know, some of those little, those shots that don't really necessarily look like they were gonna, you know, do too much damage, when you're weaker, when you're getting weaker like that as the fight goes on, you know, that steady drop of water busts the rock. So you, you see what happened at the end. And um, it, sadly enough, it turned out to, you know, Tony, Tony ended up dropping a loss there, which I thought he was going to win. But, yeah, things happen. Yeah, I was very impressed with him at the start of the fight, but it was a shame that, like I say, it came to no avail by the end. Um, you, you just said that both men are about six foot one. I don't know if you checked that up, but you got it bang on. Both men are literally six foot one. So good stats there from Eddie Chambers. <laughs> moving to the uh, moving to the main event now. Deontay Wilder, thirty seven and zero going into this fight with thirty six knockouts. He was in there against Gerald Washington, friend of the show. Gerald Washington, 18-0, and 0, both men undefeated. Combined record of 55-0, and 0, somebody's O had to go. Obviously, Gerald Washington bringing one draw to the table as well. So uh, the fight went to the fifth round before Deontay Wilder landed a bomb, which we see him pull out the bag. Sometimes in fights, he's actually losing. He just throws this wonder punch, lands it. And gets his opponents out of there. That is what happened in round five. Um, the first four rounds, I've got to say, just like a lot of other people said, he was getting beat in every aspect of the game. Um, Gerald Washington, as I say, with only three weeks notice for this fight, was dictating the pace, was holding center of the ring, was you know making him eat the jab for every single second of the round. Not too much. What I did like was there was not too much action in the first couple of rounds. And I think that Gerald Washington was pacing himself cleverly as well for those later rounds. So I think the whole way he played his cards was absolutely perfect, spot on. But like I say, Wilder managed to find a big punch in round five. And uh, that was all she wrote. So Eddie, what did you make of that fight? Because obviously, you know, you're in and about the, the heavyweight division. I know that you definitely had a keen eye on this one. Yeah, you know, what I seen was, honestly, and, you know, some people might want to kill me for saying this, but it looks it looked like Gerald was outclassing him, you know what I mean, in the fight. You know what I mean? He was behind his jab. He looked like he'd been, he like he was the champion at the time, and, and Deontay was, uh, you know, you know, challenging. Um, as I, I, don't, I don't criticize fighters. You know, I, generally, I really don't like to do that. You know, obviously, what Deontay's been doing has been working for him. But it's just it scares me for him as he goes on, you know, further into boxing and, you know, into superstardom is that, you know, you, you can't keep facing guys like like these guys. And I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, Gerald is, you know, obviously class enough to be at that level. He fought for the world title. You got to give him credit. You know, he even beat me. So, you know, I give him credit for that. But, you know, Deontay, just looking at his his um, his development. As a fighter, and a lot of it, there's a lot of things lacking with him. You know what I mean? When you th- when you think of putting him in here with Joshua, when I'm looking at Joshua and how he fought Martin, and how he's fought, uh, you know, Dillian White and different guys who are actually decent, talented fighters in certain ways, and he's able to pull them apart. When you look at that, you look at Klitschko, and you look at the Tyson Furies of the world, and you just and you look at Deontay, and it's like Deontay's game is predicated on a one punch knockout, and that's all you have. What about when that one punch knockout is not landing? You're going to have to fall back on some kind of skill, some kind of thing that you acquired as a fighter on your way up to being a world champion. Now, I'm not saying he was gifted everything, you know what I mean? But what I am saying is that a lot of these fights he's had hasn't really prepared him for that next level. And it's scary for me to look at him and say, okay, well, let's put him in there with Vladimir Klitschko. Let's put him with Anthony Joshua. Let's put him with Tyson, let's put him with Tyson Fury. And then you look and you say, well, where's the development at? All he's looking is to land that big shot. It's like you can see him saying certain things when he's in there, like, yeah, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him eventually. He's going to land eventually. Well, sometimes that eventually never happens. Then what are you going to fall back on? You know what I'm saying? Gerald Washington, I felt, looked as good as he's looked in, in, um, you know, in his career, especially at the highest level, which you expect that and you hope that a fighter at that level, you know, that gets to, a, gets to that level can perform at his best. And he did that. But I think he 
fell victim to his inexperience and thinking about the crowd and thinking about what people want instead of just winning now and looking good later. If he would have done that, we might be talking, having a different conversation right now. But like I said, going forward, Deontay Wilder has a lot to look to, a lot to worry about, a lot to think about. You know, him and Mark Breland have to go back to the drawing board and really figure out what it is he needs to do to improve his boxing game going forward. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I do want to point out the scorecards as well, which I just, um, for a couple of seconds, forgot to mention. Uh, the scorecards, which were absolutely atrocious. We know it was in Deontay Wilder's backyard, but, um, you know, for me, and I, and I think you agree with me, Eddie, we had Gerald winning all four of those first rounds. Yeah, yeah. I think just about everybody else would, you know, they haven't didn't have any ties to the to the venue and to, to the whole situation like that. Probably had the same kind of card. Yeah, and obviously the official cards. I can't remember the names of the judges, but two judges had it thirty eight thirty eight uh, going into that fifth round. So that's a draw. And one judge, and I really just don't understand how, had it thirty nine thirty seven in favor of. Uh, Deontay Wilder, which is just crazy. So it looks like he was being set up. Uh, Gerald Washington was being set up to be robbed anyway. So um, it's horrible to to know that when he was doing so well. But um, yeah, I, you know, we'll leave that fight alone. I don't want to um, cause too much of a debate on it. But what I will say, Eddie, you you sort of say that he can't really rely on this one punch, and it's not always going to happen eventually. He's done it with everyone, and when he did have to box against Bermain Stavern. He he pulled it out of the bag and shocked quite a few people. So I think he's got a little bit more skill than maybe you're giving him credit for. Well, no, I mean, well, it, it all depends on the opponent too. You know what I mean? And I think as as nice and as good as some of the things I've seen Bermain Stavern do in fights, they were done in fights that were tailor made for him. <clears throat> when you look at him fighting Ray Austin, he struggled bad with Ray Austin. He didn't struggle as much with uh, – he actually did kind of struggle a bit with um, Chris Ariola. But the only thing is he was able to show class in certain areas by his boxing skills and his speed in certain areas. But now we're talking about him fighting Deontay Wilder, an athletic, tall guy who in this fight probably looked at it like, I can't let this guy get too close. He's a puncher. He lands a big shot. Who knows where I'll go? So he was smart enough to stay behind the jab, but that does not correct – a lot of the other flaws. And remember, now he fought this last guy. He fought with six foot six. He's standing, he's staring him in the eye. So there's really no advantage in height and length, like he had with Stavern. So it looks good. He looks, you know, the athletic upright boxer against a shorter guy who's looking to throw looping right hands. Who's not really being that active. But then when you get somebody who's standing behind their jab, who has a bit more height, even up in every way, you see the flaws. You understand what I'm saying? You put him in there with a with a, with the Anthony Joshua. You put him in there with the Tyson Fury or the Klitschko, and these are the guys I mentioned. Even a Joseph Parker. You put him in there with that Huey Fury, who's about to fight Joseph Parker. These are these are fights that you put him in, and these guys are staring him in the face. These guys are doing different things. They're they're not going to be standing directly in front of him. They're going to have other little things that they're going to throw into the game, a little more sauce to the mix. And you know, then what is he going to do? What is he going to fall back on? Yeah, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. But we'll leave that there. We've given Wilder quite a few minutes of our time now. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the last um, the last fight to mention on the review part of the show. Uh, this one happening... Well, this one happened, I should say, over in the Celebrity Theatre in Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Uh, one fight to mention, as I say, BJ Flores, 32-3 and three with one draw, coming off of that defeat to Tony Bellew, where he was stopped in... Well, in quite an embarrassing fashion, he picked up the vacant WBA, NABA heavyweight title. It seems like he's going to be campaigning at heavyweight for the near future. Uh, he picked up a TKO in round one over Jeremy Bates. So a good win there for BJ Flores. And that's really it for the reviewing. There's one last thing to do, as always, before we end part one. And that, of course, is to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the trainer of Vladimir Klitschko and also a man that's been around the block in terms of experience himself, Mr. Jonathan Banks. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's been a while, Johnny. It has. Now, um, first things first, you had success on the weekend when your female superstar of a boxer, Cecilia Baracus, retained all of her 
um, all of her welterweight world titles, the WBC, WBA, WBO, IBO, and IBF belts. Uh, she also moved to 30-0, and outpointing Clara Svensson over 10 rounds. I didn't catch the fight, JB, if I'm being honest, but how did that go? You know, I thought the fight, I thought it went good. She, um, she had to overcome a few things in the fight. Um, well, I guess, you know, most fighters, once they get tired, that's when, you know, you pretty much have them. And Cecilia, she was tired, and she got tired in the fight. But that's the reason. Why, that's also the same reason why we work hard in camp, so you can you could keep your composure while you're tired and still be able to perform. And I thought she performed like extremely well. Yeah, and I know that you've expressed before that she, she how much of a hard worker she is. Like you said before, that she uh, she works as hard as the men do. If I'm not mistaken, was some kind of plaque unveiled this week for her? It, it was in Bergen, actually. It was in um, her home, her hometown, Bergen, Norway. Um, it was a um, some type of uh, Hall of Fame thing that they was having for. Her. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, they got her name on the sidewalk and everything, so it was like really, it was really huge. Brilliant, man, brilliant stuff. Good to see her finally getting some well-deserved recognition. Yeah, um, I now- think it's great for all women all over the world, man. I think it's awesome that because they would, look how hard women has been fighting for so many years. You got. American superstar like Ann Wolf, um, huge puncher. You got Layla Lee. She got her recognition because of the name, mm-hmm. you know. But you got Christy Martin, Lucia Riker. You got females like like these that didn't get the proper recognition, but they were so good at what they did, you know. And I think it's great that you know you got a lot of females now that's getting recognition for what they're doing. The two-time Olympic gold medals, uh, Clarissa, Clarissa Shields. So. You got a lot of things, big things going around for um, for female boxing. Yes, yeah, definitely uh, getting a, getting a lot more exciting. Now, before we get into the Joshua and Klitschko questions, uh, I wanted to ask you: Did you catch the Wilder and Washington fight on the weekend? If so, what did you make of it? I didn't see all of it. I seen bits and pieces because I had just arrived home when the fight was already happening when I landed. So, but you know. Um, Washington asked me when he when the fight was made. He asked me, um, "Do I got any words for him?" And I, and I told him to keep his hands up and keep his feet moving, you know, because if you sit still in front of Deontay Wilder, um, he will put you to sleep. That's that's just the bottom line of any puncher in any weight class in any division, you know, male or female. If you sit in front of a puncher, you're gonna get hit hard. <laughs> you know, fight won't go the distance. And now the big one, April the 29th, Wembley Stadium. I just want to give you my opinion on this, Jonathan. I've, I, I, said it to, um, I said it to someone the other day, I think on last week's show, but this is how I actually see this whole situation, and you can tell me what you think. Um, Klitschko was the man to beat. To be the man, you've got to beat the man. Klitschko was the man. Tyson Fury beat him, although it was a, you know, we, we can't take nothing away from Tyson Fury, even though it was a really bad Klitschko that night. Now, Tyson Fury's on this hiatus. He's gone from boxing. He's absent from the sport at the moment. So, for me, the man title should go back to Klitschko. That's the way I see it. The way I see it, it's like the heavyweight division's like a, like a playground. And, and Klitschko was like the bully of the playground. And then a, a, a kid from another school in Tyson Fury comes, beats the bully, but then leaves. So, so really... Uh, the way I see it is that Vladimir Klitschko is still the bully of the division. He's still the main man. That's the way I see it. Do you agree with that analogy? Well, somewhat. I, I think that Tyson Fury stood up to the bully better than anyone else have. You know, because looking at the fight, no one really got, like, you can't, no one, it's not nothing significant either fight have done to say, well, I, I think I won or I think I won. I mean, it's not so much of what Tyson Fury did, take it nothing away from him. Tyson Fury is a good dude, he's a good fighter, and all that. But it was also what Vladimir Klitschko didn't do in the fight. That's all it was about, was what he didn't do in the fight. Because he he literally didn't do anything, you know? So I think he still, Klitschko has a lot to prove. But um, I like your scenario. I think it's like, I think it's really, really close to, to how it is. Yeah, because for me, I reinstate Klitschko as the man to beat. For example, if I give my honest opinion, I think that 
for me, if I was the one making the odds, I would put Klitschko to favour against Joshua. That's just the way I see it. I think he's going to win that fight, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, I do want to ask you this. I've seen the press conference when they first met over in London, and, and I've got to be honest, I see a difference in Klitschko in, in the press conference from where from the press conferences he had with Fury I know that it's hard to sort of outspeak Fury he came in as Batman and all that stuff but he just seems a different person he, I really believe him when he says he's obsessed of getting his belts back I really believe him he, he seems a lot hungrier what is that I, it's quite scary seeing it in, it in in him at this age to be honest what is it, that JB it is you know he got one of the most him and so one thing about um, Vladimir and his big brother Vitaly it's hard to have them in the same room and having conversations because they're so competitive against each other. They're just competitive natured people. No matter what he do, he wants to win at it. No matter what. These these he's so obsessed with the with the theory of winning. You know, even in in anything he do, like no matter what it is, he wants to beat someone. He wants to win at it. And that's that's what it is. I mean, I guess over a course of a 12-year run, you kind of get comfortable with winning. You know, so the wins is good, but you're so used to it. It's those, it doesn't mean as much to you as it made the first or the second one did. And I think he just this is just a piece of him that's getting back to the reality that, you know, losing is an option, but I don't want that for me. And he's just getting back to what he wants. And realizing that, you know, the reason he got into this in the first place, the reason he got up off the canvas in 2004 is because he was obsessed with winning and becoming the best heavyweight in the world. And he managed, and I honestly think that he did a hell of a job to get himself up off the canvas in 2004 and look at the run he had from 2004 to 2015 or 16. So, so you see it as well, uh, a change in him since that, since that Fury fight, as uh, you know, up to now. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like he woke up. You know, it's like he woke up and realized, you know what? Like, I, I have to. Every this is not, you know, it, it's not, it's not. It's gonna be. I, I, I have to work harder to win. This type of thing. I have to do whatever it is I have to do to win. And, and that's what it's all about. He wants to win. Now he he sees again. He haven't had this feeling for a long time, how it feels to lose a fight. Yeah. And now he has this feeling. He said, you know what? This is that reason why, you know, I fight so hard and I work so hard in the gym because I hate this feeling. And that's what it is. He's obsessed with getting his titles back because he hates the feeling of not being a winner, of not winning. And of course, it's also his chance to become a three-time world champion. Uh, I do want to ask you, JB, uh, how is Vlad's camp going? I I believe he's out in Austria. Um, You're not there at the moment, though, are you? Well, he hasn't started yet, actually. Oh, he hasn't started yet? Okay. I'll be leaving in a couple of days to go go with him. That's quite a short time, though. Like, you know, that's quite... That's what's that going to be, about nine weeks or so? That's like a long time. Really? For Vlad, so, I think he'd be in like a twelve-week camp at least. Nah. Okay. I mean, people need twelve-week camps. In my opinion, if you got a twelve-week camp, that's because you got a, such a hard life that you're living that you got to quit some things, you got to lose a bunch of weight, you got to get back to normal life, and then start preparing for a fight. That's, I mean, a twelve-week camp. That is insane to go twelve weeks. Um. Like that. I mean, if your lifestyle, look at Joshua. As a matter of fact, look at look at um, all the previous champions right now. All the current champions. I'm sorry. Look at Wilder. Look at Joshua. Um, put Klitschko in that group. Um, put Parker in that group. They all pretty much boxing is they. This is their lifestyle. This is a way of life for them. They're always looking like they in shape on the physical standpoint. They look like they're in shape. There's no, they they 25 pounds overweight, so they got to get in camp to see if they can lose this weight. You know, these guys, this is a lifestyle. Vladimir been doing it longer, but this is a lifestyle for these guys. So a, a 12-week camp, to me, makes no sense. Okay. And, um, yeah, when are you flying out to, to, to Austria? 
I'll be um, heading out this weekend. Okay, cool, cool. And um, I want to ask you this, because a lot of people, you know, Joshua's knocked out everybody he stepped in the ring with as a pro. A lot of people... I think there's a lot of hype around his power. If you actually watch, I don't think yet he's actually put anyone to sleep. I think it's it's mainly been the referee waving it off. I don't really. Fi- I think people go a bit too wild on his power. Would you say that Vladimir is the harder puncher of the two? Man, come on now, you can't. That's comparing apples to oranges. That's not even. That's not even fair <laughs> to any heavyweight that's in the division right now. Any champion. That's not fair to none of them to compare. Vladimir's power to their power because of the simple fact of look at his record. You know, he got more knockouts than all of them have fights. Yeah, yeah. Against, you know, his knockout ratio is, is insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so so I, I, it's difficult to answer that. Like, in their own right, is is Deontay Wilder a big puncher? I will say yes, looking at his record. Is, is Anthony Joshua a big puncher? I'm going to say yes, looking at his record. Before Deontay Wilder became champion, the most the most knockout the highest knockout ratio was Vitaly Klitschko. <laughs> you know, looking at looking at what he did and look at the competition that he's faced. You got Corey Sanders. You got I mean you got a host of people. Uh, Danny Williams, you know, which is not an easy guy to fight. You know, and Danny Williams was in his was 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 in a good shape in his prime at that time. So you got all these guys that um. You know, did he face? So it, it's difficult to say who's the who's the biggest puncher, or Joshua's not that big of a puncher. You know, because of um because of that knockout ratio. I think he's to me what that tells me is that both got, all these guys are big punch. I'm sorry, are big punchers. Was they one punch knockouts? I mean, no, they wasn't. But did the guys knees buckle and did they fall? You know, yes, they did. I still think Vladimir is the bigger puncher in the division. In the whole, this is the whole division. I think he's the biggest puncher, but I think Joshua also is a big puncher, and I think either guy can hurt each other on the night. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, for me, I think I think Vladimir is probably the bigger puncher of the two, in my honest opinion. Uh, coming to the last couple of questions now, JB, you've seen them spar before. A lot of people say that he more than held his own with Klitschko, even though this was Joshua a couple of years back, obviously before he won his world title. Um, I know that we're not going to talk about exactly what happened, but can you shed any light on that whatsoever? I mean, I can talk about what happened. There's no secret. I mean, um, it was, a, it was, it was, it was a pretty good. It was a pretty good spine match. I mean, Joshua got in there after Vladimir had went about six to eight rounds already, and um, and they they was boxing. It was it wasn't toe to toe. It wasn't tick for tat, but you can you can tell who had the most experience in the ring. You had you could tell you could see clearly who was landing the most punches, you know, and it was Vladimir. But at the same time. Keep in mind, this is nothing against Joshua. Joshua did a very good job. Joshua and Wilder was in the same camp together, and they both did a, a very, very good job in sparring. You know, so it, it was really good. It was it was a really good and competitive sparring match. That, that's why I'm saying this fight is going to be a hell of a fight because the sparring session was really competitive. Okay, and... Um... And I want to ask you this now. I know that Vlad has fought a hell of a lot of guys, um, a long list of, of, of good fighters. Would you say he's fought anybody like Anthony Joshua um, in all those years, in all those defenses? Obviously, a man like Joshua who is coming up hungry and young at the same sort of level that Joshua's at at the moment. I mean, coming from a gold medalist, besides the height, Alexander Povetkin, besides the height. Another gold medalist that was that was clearing through everybody. Um, have you faced someone so young and 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 that's a gold medalist with those accolades? No, but um, he has faced guys that was big and strong. He has faced guys that was awkward. He has faced guys that was really talented. But it, it's it's that's not the, it's like I see Vladimir. He's he's able to adjust very well. But the thing is. Um, Joshua has never faced no one within ten miles or 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 t- ten years of the way how Vladimir is right now. So that's going to be the hardest puzzle. 
is how would Joshua, you know, defend himself? How would he cope with, with this particular style? And finally, Jonathan, um, yeah, I want to ask you this straight and simple, to be honest. A prediction. How do you see this fight ending in your heart of hearts, April 29th, Wembley Stadium in the UK? There's going to be 90,000 people in attendance. The place is going to be jumping. How does this fight end? This place is going to be jumping off the rockers, man. The fight will end in a knockout because both both fighters have something to prove. I think Joshua is on the verge of proving that he's the real deal. And Klitschko's on the verge of proving that, um, you know... But he's I'm, I'm, still the real deal. I'm not done. I'm still I'm here. As long as I'm here, this division is going to have problems because I'm going to be a title holder. You know, he... Um, he, I just, it's like a lot of people he's trying to erase the situation, the things he done, because he lost the decision to Tyson Fury. You know, no long reigning, both of our long reigning heavyweight champions was Joe Lewis and Larry Holmes, two of the longest reigning champions that we had. One for the most time, and the other one for the most defenses. But um, neither one of them lost their title and, and actually came back to win again. Neither one. Um, so I think that's what's going to make this so special for Vladimir also, is that he well, he is the second or third long, longest reigning champion in history. He lost the title, and he came back to win the title again and to continue his run for however many times he wants to fight again. I think that's going to be also an, another special piece inside of his arsenal and his career. Absolutely. All right, Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. We've left it quite long since we last spoke to you. My apologies for that. We'll definitely hey. make some time for you to come on after the fight, of course, and we wish well, you the appreciate- best of luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. Speak soon, my man. Okay, take care. Speak soon. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part, where we preview the fights coming up this weekend. Just before we get into that, myself and Eddie have got a little roundup of the news, the boxing news from around the world this week. Um, Usually, again, Ayaz would bring in the news. Um, We don't have too much to go over, but what I will say is there's a lot of rumors. It's not actually been made official yet, I don't think. Um, Manny Pacquiao taking on Amir Khan, the, uh, the date... He's supposed to be, I believe it's the, I think it's the 23rd of April, um, which is actually a Sunday. It's supposed to happen over in Dubai. Amir Khan and Manny Pacquiao both tweeted that the fight's on. We haven't actually seen an official statement. I think Bob Arum's saying a completely different thing. We're not too sure, um, so we're not going to talk too much about it. But what I will say is... It's more interesting that this fight's happening now rather than a few years back, maybe four years ago, something like that. A lot of people say that Khan is on the decline. A lot of people say that Manny Pacquiao is on the decline. I think it would actually make for a more competitive fight now. Um, Khan obviously being you know, the, the bigger natural guy. Pacquiao slowed down a bit. Khan might slow down a bit. They're both very, very fast. Manny Pacquiao, obviously, you know, known at one stage as this knockout machine. He hasn't knocked anybody out for a long, long time. A long, long time. Khan, obviously, we all know about his chin. It's intriguing. Um, That's as much as I'll say about it at this stage. But I think it's a good time for Khan. But it will be quite embarrassing if, after going years and years without knocking anybody out, you know, fighting the likes of Chris Algieri and whatever, you know, he was unable to stop any of these guys, Manny Pacquiao, and if he was to do it to a Brit like Amir Khan, it would be quite sad. But, um, yeah, hopefully that hopefully that fight happens. We can talk a bit more about it. Um, just just in a nutshell, just in a nutshell, Eddie, how do you see that fight playing out? I know that it may not even happen, but it's, it's, it's a good fight for me, anyway, to think about. Well, I mean, it is definitely an interesting matchup. I think it's going to be an exciting fight because they're both... You know, like, I don't want to say come forward. They're boxer types, but they like to overpunch, let's say. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they're they the kind of guys where, in my in my estimation, when I train my guys and I work with uh, different people, when I talk about boxing and myself, I don't like to throw more than three at a time in a certain situation um, because it can be um, it can be dangerous. You know, you got other people. I mean, you got other fighters, and if you got a fighter in front of you, especially me being, you know, fighting these big guys, you know, I just don't like throwing uh, more than that many punches. And then I'm looking at, 
you know, Manny, Manny's footwork. And sometimes, like I said, he, not, he over punches and he comes forward a little bit too heavy on the front foot. And that's exactly how he got caught with that uh, ugly Marquez right hand. You know what I mean? And uh, the same thing goes for uh, Amir Khan. He does the same type of thing. And you look at when he fought Danny Garcia, you know, he stands straight up with his head up in the air sometime, throws too many punches in that position, punches down, and then all of a sudden Danny Garcia, you know, with, with, with the, uh, not necessarily the shoulder roll, but bringing uh, one of those uh, haymaker left hooks coming across the top, caught him, put him on his butt, and that kind of stuff can happen. Both of these guys. So them fighting each other just makes for a very, very interesting and fun matchup to see. And then, like you said, they're both fast. There's a lot of skills that's going to be – there's a lot of skill that's going to be involved. So it'll be fun to watch. And even, like, the you know, the people that like to see raw skill as well – I mean, uh, uh, good skill as well will will be very interested in watching this fight. It's a good one. Yeah, for sure. Also, a fight just announced. It's going to happen over in the Echo Arena in Liverpool, uh, UK, of course. On the well, actually, the day before the rumored scheduled um, Pacquiao and Calm fight, on the twenty second of April. As I say, I've already said the venue. Um, a fight happen, which which really a lot of people are kind of happy about it. I, for one, am not too happy about it. I do not think it's a very good fight. Martin Murray. Moving back down to middleweight, obviously last time out, um, didn't look very impressive against the uh, that that guy. I forgot his name, but he, basically an unbeaten fighter that he took on over in Monte Carlo. Didn't look very impressive. Obviously before that, losing to George Groves, he should have been a world champion a couple of times. He's he's been you know robbed in 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 champions backyards before, but he's taken on Gabriel Rosado, who I don't want to be overcritical, but. You know, whenever he's kind of stepped it up, he's 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 a tough guy. You know, he's he's a bit of a warrior. They're both warriors to a certain extent, but I think both of them have really seen better days. Um, you know, both not in great form right now. People are going wild about it. Uh, I think both guys really are kind of. I don't want to say the same level. I think it's a little bit disrespectful to Martin Murray because I think Martin Murray's been in those world title fights. He's come so close a number of times. Um, you know, always fighting in the champion's backyard as well. Gabriel Rosado, for me, he's not he's not very good. And I just think that this this whole fight here is um well, it's it's a, it's a bit of a warrior matchup, but for me, it's not one I'm interested in. I'd I'd much rather name ten or fifteen different opponents for both guys to fight before before seeing this one. But hey, I don't make the fights. Um, that's it for that one there. And the final piece of news that we've got before we get onto the previewing is the WBC have officially confirmed that Bermain Stavern is the mandatory contender for. Deontay Wilder's WBC world title. Um, the negotiations, I believe, began this week. So, um, interesting to see what happens there. But to be honest, it's not an interesting fight. I know for one, Eddie, you're probably <laughs> you're probably not really looking forward to this one. Uh, Bermain Stavern and, and Wilder in a rematch. I particularly don't really want to see it. Uh, what's your thoughts on that one? I mean, uh, you know, it could be a repeat of the same thing. I mean, you know, like when I keep thinking about him with taller guys, I mean, I've seen him do well as an amateur against taller guys. I think he actually was with David Price as an amateur, I think, or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Did well. But since a professional, since I've seen him fight Ray Austin and then obviously with Deontay, uh, it just he just hasn't looked, you know, you know, as good as I would have expected. You know what I mean? He's just it, it's not easy. You know I mean I'm not knocking him. You know, it's not a, it's not an easy thing to fight a guy that's, you know, about five or six inches taller than you and, and, and probably a bit heavier or maybe not. But um, you know, if you gotta be in there with him, you gotta make do. You gotta make the best of the best of, a, of a tough situation. And I just don't know if he can do that. Is he gonna be in the right condition? Is he gonna be willing to, you know, put forth a better effort? You know what I mean against the uh, the rangy guy. You know what I mean. Will he be able to step inside and throw some nice overhand rights, or will he just settle for, you know, taking punches and catching them, you know, in, on the gloves? Hopefully not getting stopped. You know, so that'll dictate whether it's an interesting matchup or not. Not really that excited about it, but, you know, maybe he's going to surprise us all. Yeah, and I just will point out that um, I'm not too sure how Stiverne has ended up in, in, in this position, really, because his last fight was in uh, November of 2015, where he outpointed uh -huh. Derek Rossi. And it, and it was a quite a an under impressive fight. It wasn't. It was quite close on all three of the scorecards. It was a ten rounder, and he uh -huh. just about scraped it. And also, he was on the canvas in in round one. Derek Rossi's a man you know very well, Eddie. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. I fought, I fought him twice actually, and you know, this is what I'm saying about about a lot of these guys, and it just surprises me sometimes, you know. And these are the elite fighters that we have. You know, he was a former world champion. You know what I mean? And I'm looking at it. I'm just saying, where did I go wrong? You know, where did I miss this stuff? You know what I mean? I didn't. I just was never. I guess you know, at the level when I was competing, you know what I mean? There was. Um, the guys that were available were the Klitschko brothers, and that's it. You know what I mean? So you can't really – there's not a lot you can look for. There's not a lot you can hope for. The division has – you know, the, the only thing you can do is go in there and, and beat one of them, and that's what I intended to do. It just didn't work out that way. But now the belts are spread apart. You know, there's different guys there. There's, 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 there's a lot of availability. The division is hot right now. And, um, you know, it's just like, man, why could not I be in that position a few years back? My interest now in heavyweight division is very low, you know what I mean? But if there's some guys my size, I'll be interested in competing to get them. But back to this, and um, like I said, looking at that fight with him and Derek Rossi, and Derek Rossi has been a decent contender. You know, he's he's done some things. He's, uh, he's surprised a lot of people with some of the fights he's, he's been able to put together. But once again, he's not the elite elite, you know what I'm saying? But he competed like he was against Stavern. So isn't that telling you something? <laughs> you know, who's elite? You know what I mean? Who's not? Yeah, definitely. Um, as I say, definitely. I don't know how he ended up in that position, in, in the mandatory position, but uh, it's not a fight I'm particularly uh, really waiting on like a lot of other fights that's happened in 2017 that I genuinely am waiting on. But um, nonetheless, you know, I'm definitely going to be watching. Um, yeah, that's it for the news. We're going to jump on to the previewing now. We're going to try to go through this as quick as we can. So on Thursday, the 2nd of March, so it should be um, probably a few hours after this goes out, um, Sinshuk Yamanaka puts his WBC World Bantamweight title on the line against Carlos Carlson. That's the name. Uh, Yamanaka, obviously, 26-0 and with two draws. Yamanaka, a true, true good fighter. A lot of people even putting him in their top 10, top 15, pound for pound. He's definitely one to look out for. Uh, Carlos Carlson, 22-1. and one. So this should be a decent fight, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know bunches about both of these guys, but still... Good match up there in Tokyo, Japan at the Koku Jikan. I think that's the venue. I might have completely cocked that one up, but I'm not too sure. Um, moving over now to Poland. Uh, one fight to mention over here. Uh, Matthias Mastanek, 37-4. and four. Matthias Mastanek. He fights Alexander Kubic, who has a record of 9-2. and two. In terms of records, it definitely looks like a mismatch. Um, we'll have to wait and see the outcome of that one over in Poland. Moving over now to the Grand Connell Rooms in Holborn, London. That's my type of venue, UK. Um, fighting on this bill, Ben Jones, he gets out again. His record 22-5 and five with one draw. I remember getting him on the show. Um, many moons back now. He was a nice guy, so we wish him all the best. Also, Bobby Gunn Jr. is on this bill as well. His record at the moment, 8-0. He's in a four-rounder at super middleweight, obviously looking to move to 9-0. His opponent yet to be announced. Kirk Garvey's also on this bill as well in his ninth professional outing. Uh, that's really it for Holborn, London. Moving over to the big one now. There's two big ones this weekend, but moving over to the big one in the UK, I'm going to start with first at the O2 Arena, Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. I'm going to start with the undercard. Uh, Ted Cheeseman's also on this bill. He um, His record at the moment, 7-0. and His opponent yet to be announced. Katie Taylor's on this bill as well. In her third contest, it's a six-rounder, of course, two-minute rounds there. Uh, Lee Selby gets out again. Obviously, he you know he tried to fight on the Carl Frampton undercard. His opponent just hours before the fight fouled some sort of I believe it was some sort of blood test um, for for some kind of um, some kind of illness or something. I can't really remember now, but he was very frustrated that he didn't get to fight. He made the weight and he was afraid that it was all going to go to waste. But no, he gets out on this bill. It's a non-title bout because uh, the guy that they they found this opponent, he's actually. Uh, he's not he's not ranked in the top 15, so it's only a 10-rounder at featherweight. Uh, his opponent's name is Andoni Gago. I've never heard of him. 
most people haven't. Again, Lee Selby's on this bill purely just for his name. Um, it's, it's it's a big name on a big bill. Uh, and Donny Gago has a record of 16-2 and two with two draws. He's never really fought anybody of note. Uh, he's a Spaniard. And I think, to be honest, he's going to probably lose this fight by an early stoppage. But Lee Selby, a class fighter, a friend of the show, 23-1. and one. We wish him all the best. Also on this bill, a fight that has captured a lot of interest this week especially. O'Hara Davis, 14-0. and 0. He takes on Derry Matthews, 38-11 and 11, with two draws. We've had both guys on the show before. Uh, most recently, Derry Matthews, he actually told us, if you remember a few weeks back, that he believes he's going to make O'Hara Davis quit on his stall. O'Hara Davis obviously put in his WBC silver super lightweight title on the line. Um, it's an intriguing contest. Both men in different parts of their careers, clearly. Uh, O'Hara Davis, he's on the up. Derry Matthews, he's definitely on the way down. It makes for a interesting fight, to be honest, but one that I think the younger and fresher guy, O'Hara Davis, will probably come out victorious, and that's me being honest. But best of luck to both guys. Both guys, pure gentlemen. Both guys, um, great guests on our show. And like I say, may the best man win at the end of the day. That's a 12-rounder, of course. Also on that, Bill, Sam Eggington. This one's the hardest fight to uh you know, to give a, 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 an accurate prediction on of the whole weekend for me. I've been asking everyone about this on Twitter and, and what have you, and a lot of people are not too sure who to go with. So if you want to get involved, you can get involved with us on Twitter. Just send us a tweet, um, at Box Hard Podcast. You know where to find us. So Sam Eggington, 19 and 3, putting his WBC international welterweight title on the line against Paulie Malinagi, 36 and 7. Paulie obviously um, he's been there, done it, got the t-shirt. He's a former two-weight world champion, but of course we all know his better days are well and truly behind him. Uh, he's fought so many guys. When you look at his resume, and I I've, I've got to be completely honest, when you look at his resume, he's got one of the best resumes of, of any active boxer, he's really been around the block. He's done things the hard way. We all know that he's very, very feather-fisted. We know that Sam Eggington, um, he's a little bit one-dimensional. He comes forward. He's, he's, he's absolutely in brilliant condition, as always. He doesn't tire. He's like a wrecking ball. He just comes forward throwing shots. And I think that Paulie... Try, you know, it's he's, he's, he's very hard for Paulie to keep pressure fighters off of him, and I think that could be to do with the fact that he just doesn't hit hard, hit hard enough to keep people off, and the size difference. Eggington is massive compared to Paulie Malinagi. Um, it, it could just be the right time for Sam Eggington. Again, he's a man that we had on the show a few weeks back. He even said it himself. He believes this fight has come at the perfect, perfect time for him, and. Um, Again, may the best man win, but it's going to go two ways. It can it can go two ways, I believe. Uh, if it's if it's a points win, we're probably looking at Paulie Malinagi. If it's a knockout, we're definitely looking at Sam Eggington. And I tell you what, if he knocks out Paulie Malinagi, Paulie Malinagi needs to retire. I think that's fair to say. I really, I really, you know, he's got no future in the sport if he if he loses this fight. He's got to fight very very smart. Uh, we've seen Sam Eggington get outboxed pretty conclusively. That was by Bradley Skeet. I hope that um, I hope that Paulie Malinagi's watched that fight because I think that was a bit of a blueprint there. Uh, main event now to talk about Tony Bellew, twenty eight and two with one draw. Of course, he's still the WBC Cruiserweight Champion of the World. The WBC have allowed him to move up in weight for this one fight. As long as he comes back down, he's still able to be champion. He's st they're letting him keep his title, which is good news. Uh, David Hay, 28-2. and two, So both men with the same wins, the same losses. 28-2, um, and two, both men, as I say. And Bellew's got that one draw. David Hay hasn't really had a proper, proper fight, a proper, proper test in about five years. I think we've got to go back to the Chisora fight till he's actually fought someone of note. No disrespect to um, to Mark Damori. Um, Tony Bellew, I think, I think someone said he's had like 111 rounds or something since David Hay fought in a proper fight, in, you know, in a, in a competitive fight. So that's staggering. Um, the inactivity with David Hay obviously brings up some question marks. Um, a lot of people also saying that, what does Tony Bellew do better than David Hay? David Hay is the faster guy. He's the more powerful guy. He's the naturally bigger guy. You know, he, he's the more elusive guy. He's got a better chin. 
it all seems it all seems to be something that I I believe a lot of people are agreeing with. I think that in some ways that's right. But we had the trainer of Tony Bell on the show last week, Dave Caldwell. He said, and he assured me, and he was very confident. Sometimes when someone says something to you, you just know that they mean what they're saying. They really believe what they're saying. And he said, listen, David, hey, can't fight. He's a boxer. He can't fight to the same way Tony Bell you can fight. If he drags him into a dogfight, and furthermore, if he drags him on past the first three or four rounds, David Hay in his peak used to gas after a few rounds. What's going to happen then? It's unknown territory. That's the way they feel. It's going to make for an intriguing fight. Um, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to favour David Hay, but may the best man win once again. Um, Eddie Chambers, I'm going to throw it down to you. I know that obviously Bell you's a friend of yours. You've sparred with him. David Hay. I wouldn't say he's too much of a friend of yours. Um, how do you see this fight playing out mainly? Oh, it's a dangerous fight for both men. I feel like, you know, David Hay, obviously, you know, most people, you know, have seen him, you know, in the past. You know, he's a popular guy. You know, he has a lot of things in his favor, most people would think, in this fight. However, Tony Bellew is very underrated. He has a very underrated skill set. Like, you know, people look at him and say, ah, oh, not really a lot I see with that. But I've shared the ring with him in sparring. I know he can punch. I know he has a, a lot better boxing IQ than a lot of people really understand. He knows what punches to throw and when. He understands range really well. And, you know, he, he, he may not have the cutesy stuff that most people do, but he's the kind of guy who will fight you. He'll fight you to the death. You know what I mean? And I really get that from him. So, you know, with David Hay being, you know, he's a talented guy. He can move. He can box. He has power in both hands. You know what I mean? Get, he gets a little fat with his punches. And for me, even though he has decent speed and, and, and ability, when you get fat with your punches, if somebody's throwing straight stuff, straight shots down Main Street, you know, a lot of times it beats those hooks. Even if the guy has a little bit better talent in certain areas and a little bit more speed here, you know, that doesn't always tell the tell. You know what I mean? You look at fights like, um, you know, I, I was watching um, – Shane Mosley at one point where I was watching a little while ago, Shane Mosley versus Vernon Flores. And most people know Shane Mosley and know how great he was as a fighter at that point. A lot of people didn't know about Vernon Flores and how good of a fighter he was. And Vernon Flores comes in there and people wonder, well, how did Shane lose to him in the Olympics? Shane is the greatest. He's going to be this. He's going to be that. And all of a sudden, Vernon comes in there, shuts all that down. You know what I mean? God rest his soul. <laughs> but, um, you know, and it's like, it doesn't always have to be the guy who's faster or more talented or punched harder or does this or does that. It just it depends on their ability of, of how, how they get their point across that day. You know what I mean? Who's the better man that night? Who has that guy's number in that particular situation? And just because it may seem, you know, m most people know David Hay. Not a lot of people know Tony Bellew. You know what I mean? Over in the UK, he's well known, but oh, in, 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 you know, in, in other places and just in general as a fighter, who's more popular? But it's not a popularity contest. It's a contest of who can fight and who's going to land that shot or land those shots that wins the fight for him. And in this in this particular case, you never know. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm riding with my man because I know him, and I feel like he has the ability to pull this off. But there's a few things he has to do. You know what I mean? David Hay didn't get here just because he's a, you know, somebody put him there. You know what I mean? He obviously had a lot of success as a cruiserweight and then some some obviously some success as a heavyweight. But, you know, don't shut a guy out. You know what I mean? You don't dismiss somebody just because you don't know them. You know what I mean? You watch and you obviously and you, you hope that that your guy is going to win, but you never know. In this situation, this might be one of those times where you wish you would have known because he might get in there and shut him down. You never know. Eddie, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, and I'm also going to put you on the spot a little bit um, with, with the next card that we're going to preview. But cool. um, if you have to pick a winner, who are you going with here? Oh, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Tony. Regardless of the situation, yeah, I got to. You know what I mean? I can't. Listen, if you were fighting David Hay right now, I'd be going with you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's because I have something to do with that. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to make sure that I'm going to give you as much as I can possibly give you from knowledge to get in there and kick that guy's ass. Not necessarily going to happen, but we can hope. And in this case, you know what I mean? I got, I got, I'm holding out hope for my man that he's going he gonna to pull it off. I know what he, what he does have. I know what he does bring to the table. But that doesn't mean that David Hayes not a, a scary guy for you know as an opponent for him. You know what I'm saying? He's a dangerous dude that can throw punches and he in, in, in good hard fast punches. So he's gonna you know uh, Tony's gonna have to get behind the jab, be smart. You know what I mean? Don't go too fast. Take your time. Let things develop. Don't rush into anything. If you feel like the guy's gonna blow after four or five rounds, let him. 
You know what I mean? He's coming in there to knock you out. He's not coming in there to win a, win a boxing match. So allow that to develop. And if it does, you got it. Again, may the best man win. It's a, it's a hard one for me because I'm, you know, I've been a big fan of Hay for many years. Um, sorry, what'd you say? No, no, I was listening. I was just listening. Yeah, no. Um, I've been a big fan for Hay for many years. Tony Bell, you especially recently, you, you know, loads of TV programs are on about him. Um, you know, Sky are doing a thing behind the ropes, and you get to see how much of a family man he is. And I've really took a like to him just recently. I mean, when I say just recently, I mean probably for the for the better part of about two years but i've been with hay from day one so it's like um it's, it's a tough one for me man I, all i can say is made the best man win i mean i think david hay is gonna win but um i would lo- I, I don't want to say who i'd love to win or who i'd love to lose because i really really like both guys and i can genuinely mean it when i say made the best man win but we're gonna leave that card there that's definitely an intriguing one i cannot wait for that one saturday night um Moving over now to the final card we've got for you in the Barclays Center, Brooklyn, New York. A great boxing venue. Seriously, one of the best boxing venues worldwide. I'm going to start with the undercard. A couple of fights to mention before we get on to the big one. I'm going to give a mention to Mario Barrios, who's in his 18th professional contest. It's an eight-rounder at super lightweight. He takes on Yardley Suarez, who has a record of 20-6. and six. So all the best to Mario Barrios. Uh, Erickson Lubin's also on this bill, a good young fighter coming up, a good prospect. He's 17-0 and 0 in his 18th contest. He takes on Jorge Cota, who has a record of 25-1. and one. A couple of good fights on this undercard. And one fight that really... Again, it's a real intriguing fight. Both guys in similar positions, but not in similar places in 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 both of their careers. Uh, Andre Fomfara, twenty eight and four, coming off of that one round knockout to Joe Smith Jr. last year, he gets straight back in in a ten rounder at light heavyweight against former light heavyweight king Chad Dawson, thirty four and four. A real intriguing fight. Obviously, um, you know, Chad Dawson mixed it at the higher level. Andre Fomfara had a bit of momentum behind him until coming up against Joe Smith Jr. Um, It's a tough, tough fight. It's a good, good fight. I'm going to throw it down to you, Eddie, and I'm going to let you share your expertise before I give my opinion on it. Oh, well, uh, that fight is uh, definitely very interesting. I mean, Chad Dawson obviously uh, has been... Obviously, in better positions before. You know, I mean, obviously, right now he's he's trying to work his way back into the into the mix. Uh, from Faro being being that he got stopped by Joe Smith Jr. in his you know in the previous fight, and but then looking at him now, he goes and he stops Bernard Hopkins. Although that was you know in in Bernard's farewell fight, and Bernard being 51, it still looks like it wasn't as bad a loss as it could have been. You know what I mean? Obviously, this kid's a crazy puncher. So, you know, the matchup with them two, I guess they're in similar situations. You know what I mean? With the exception of Chad Dawson maybe a little bit further out. You know what I mean? And, and, and yeah. it's see him, you know, being able to come back to what he once was. But it's, you know, it's a possibility. I mean, you know, looking at the losses Chad Dawson had, you know what I mean? Those are, those are fights that he could have won with the exception of him getting knocked out in the first round by, I uh, ah, can't remember the name right right off the top. Adonis Stevenson. The Stevenson. <laughs> um, you know, you know, those kinds of fights. I mean, when you lose those those kinds of fights in that way, I guess it's bad when you look at it. But in reality, he didn't get a chance to really get into the fight and see whether he could still be able to stand up to a guy like that. So it's not to say that he's completely out of the picture. You know, maybe he comes back in and really starts to show that he's still a real live dog in all these different fights that he can have. You know, there's a big, there's still a, a lot of possibilities for him. You know what I mean? As well as for far. And obviously it all depends on the, the outcome of this fight. And in the way I see it is if Chad Dawson has some of what we've seen in, pa- in the past and in, in, in his past glory, then I feel like he's going to win this fight without, without, a, without too much of a problem. I'm not saying from far as not a, uh, a, a real challenge, but I see Chai Dawson is, you know, definitely at his peak and at, his, at, at the best he's been is a bit too much for this guy. Yeah, I have to agree. I think... Um... I think Chad Dawson's fought a few guys with similar styles to Fonfara. I think that, you know, he's been, he's seen these type of guys, you know, when he was coming up. I know that, again, when he was coming up, it's been a couple of years now since he's been on that sort of world, top of the world level, which he was on for a while. Um, yeah, I think, to be honest, if I've got to be completely honest and give a prediction, I think that Chad Dawson's going to probably win this fight. He may even get him out of there. But, um, again... 
it's, it's an intriguing fight. It's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of the uh, the Paulie Malinagi and, and Sam Eggington fight just a couple of hours earlier. It's one of those fights. Both men really at different ends of their careers, and it's it's really in, it's really intriguing to see what happens. But uh, yeah, it's another fight I'm going to be watching with a keen eye. And now the main event. This is one really Eddie that I've been waiting for for a long long time I'm, I'm so happy that it's this week it's a brilliant week of boxing um, I'm going to start with the well I was going to say I'm going to start with the champion they're both champions it's a unification fight we don't get to say that too much it's a right. welterweight one of the hottest most talent packed divisions in boxing Danny Garcia 33-0 and perfect record putting his WBC world welterweight title on the line against Keith Furman 27-0 and Keith one time Furman, perfect record, putting his WBA super world welterweight title on the line. Both men undefeated. Somebody's always got to go. Both men are known for throwing big shots. They can get you out of there. What an intriguing fight. I'm going to start with my opinion first, Eddie, if you don't mind. Um, firstly, in my honest opinion, Danny Garcia, and, I, and I'm, I've got to say this, I know that you know he's, 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 he's from the same place you're from, right? Yes, sir. Philadelphia. I've got to say this. Danny Garcia has been in a couple of fights which I believe he's been very lucky to get the decision on. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I think he was he was pretty um, lucky with the Lamont Peterson fight. I think he that was quite close. I think he definitely lost to Maurizio Herrera in that little homecoming he had in Puerto Rico back in 2014. Um you know, people say he's a cherry picker. It's a bit harsh to say. He got a good win over Robert Guerrero um, just last year as well. About, I think, just over a year ago. It was early last year, that one. Um, you know, we know that he's over the hill. He's over the hill. Obviously, he fought Paulie Malinagi on the back end of 2015. For me, I think that Danny Garcia, when he fought the true top guys at 140, and when I say that, I'm talking about... You know, he he done pretty well with Matisse, we've got to be honest, it, albeit it was pretty close. Um, you know, the referee didn't do a great job in that fight. Zab Judah, that was a pretty close one, 140 again. Um, you know, Maurizio Herrera, I think he lost that fight. He had a couple, you know, Kendall Holt again, another one really that was, that was a close fight. I think that when he stepped up and fought guys that were the best guys at 140, he didn't have it all his own way. And I just wasn't too sure how legitimate of a, you know, of a champion, of a good elite fighter I would make him. Now he's moved up to 147. Uh, let's be honest, he's took on Paulie Malinagi. I've said my bit on him, he's over the hill. He's took on Robert Guerrero. Again, he's over the hill. He's took on Samuel Vargas, which um, was his last fight in November of last year. I believe that was like a former sparring partner of his. Um, you know, he, he lost to Errol Spence within four rounds. Uh, Danny Garcia took him seven. Okay, it's a decent win. He hasn't really fought anybody at the top of their game in, in the 147-pound division. He's now taking on Keith Furman who's not just any 147, he's a big 147 fighter. He's been there a long time. He's a legitimate guy at that weight. He is probably, if not the number one guy in the division, he's definitely the second. Or he's definitely he's got to be number two. It's, it's out of him and Kel Brook for me. Uh, Manny Pacquiao as well, I should also, I should also bring in. Um, I think that Keith Furman's going to conclusively outpoint him. And I think I don't think it's a it's a knockout. I think both guys very durable. I don't see anyone being a bit chinny or being you know they're quite they're quite um, compact with their defence. For me, I'm going to go with Keith Furman on points. That's just the way I see it. I think he's too big and too strong for Garcia, and I think Garcia doesn't really cope well when he's in there against the legitimate guys in his division. That's just my opinion. I'm sure you're going to have a very different one, Eddie, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw it over to you. What's your thoughts on this fight? It's a great fight. I, I know that we're definitely going to agree on that. 100%. Uh, I agree. It's a, it's, a, it's a good fight. It's the kind of fight that you want to see, you know, at this, at this level in both their careers. They're both at a peak. You know what I mean? Both are, are, are really talented fighters. They have a lot to bring to the table. They both have belts as well. But, um... I am going to differ, you know, with what I think is going to happen in the fight. The reason being is because Danny Garcia is a very underrated boxer. A lot of the fights he's had at those, you know, at the top fights in the 140-pound division was because those guys were dangerous fighters. You know, you're not going to always be able to win fights 
you know, conclusively against, you know, in, in a huge, in a, you know, in a big gap or, you know, dominate necessarily every fight. You got to be able to win fights that are close. You know what I mean? You, you, you got to be prepared to fight, you know, in the hard, just as hard in the 12th round as you did in the first in order to pick up a win. You know what I mean? So, you know, looking at, and, and this is what kind of always, you know, it's kind of bothered me a little bit about Keith Thurman. I've seen him and he's tough. I'm not saying he's not a tough guy. I'm not saying he's not able to deal but, you know, I've seen him in fights that, you know, come down to it where I thought he probably lost a fight, uh, namely with um, my main man. Ah, uh, crap. Can't get his name out right now. But it was the last fight that I remember. Sean Porter. Sean Porter. I thought, I mean, don't get me wrong. I thought the fight was very close. And a lot of people thought that um, a lot of people thought that um, uh, that uh, Keith Thurman won the fight. But I was, in, you know, maybe I don't want to say a minority, but I was one of the ones that thought Sean Porter did enough to win. And he was coming forward. He, he, he did. I think he did a lot of good work. And I think, uh, you know, going down the stretch, you know, Sean Porter, I thought, pulled it off. But, you know, he didn't get the decision. And that's what happens. But um, in this particular fight, I think, you know, Danny comes forward well, but he also can box well. You know, a lot of people don't look at what he does as, as a boxer as much. You give him credit for that. You know, he throws a lot of punches in varying places. You know, he's, he, can, he can go to the body as well as go upstairs. And we've seen Keith Thurman, you know, have a bit of issues, you know, a little bit of issues with body punches. So, you know what I mean? That may be something to focus on in the fight and pay attention. And if, you know, maybe a big body shot lands, who knows what may happen. And, you know, they're both really good punchers. And I know you said, uh, Joey, that there's a possibility that the, you know, for them, you know, for the most part, they're going to probably go the distance, but you never know. And in this kind of a fight with the kind of shots these guys throw, this could end early, you know what I mean? Or at least halfway through. So, you know, I think, you know, those are things to keep an eye on, but I'm going to have to ride with Danny. You know, I think, you know, he does, you know, he's, he's, a, he gets, sometimes he gets a little fat with his punches, but I think he's a little bit the sharper puncher in a way. You know what I mean? He throws, uh, uh, you know, the looping variety of his, a lot of his shots, but they're very sharp and they're very direct. And they can also surprise you because he throws from different angles. You know what I mean? So it's going to be that kind of thing. And sometimes I, th I see Keith Thurman's head up in the air a little bit. And, you know, that also would bother me if I was a, you know, a supporter of Keith Thurman. So, like I said, I'm going to ride with Danny. You know what I mean? I think his, uh, I think he's a little bit, you know, a little bit ahead of the curve in certain ways with, uh, with this fight. I think it's at the right time for him. And I'm looking to see him win. And do you see that um, on points or do you see inside the distance? <sighs> to be honest, you know, it, it depends on, for me, it depends on where the fight takes place. You know, whether it's at range or if, you know, if, if I think if Dandy is able to come forward or is forced to come forward. You know, if he's forced to come forward and, and work the body a bit, he could stop him. Or he could stop him, you know, later, I would say, later in the fight, you know, eight, ninth round possibly. But uh, reality is, I think it's probably going to be a points decision as well. But you never know. These guys punch hard enough to where you may may not have seen them hurt before to the chin. But some of these shots they throw could, could definitely uh, – change that you know what i mean so it could it could turn out to be a, a knockout as well but i'm looking um i'm looking at a point decision for for danny definitely a really intriguing fight and like i say saturday this saturday coming up the 4th of march is 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 a place where if you're a boxing fan you've got to be near a tv you've got to be in a boxing venue somewhere in the world it is just a completely Boxing week this week. It's, it's a brilliant, brilliant thing to be a part of boxing at the moment. Boxing's absolutely booming worldwide, so everybody I'm expecting to be listening to this has, has got to be near a TV set on Saturday night. Um, before we end part two, because we've uh, we've gone through all the previewing now, before we end part two, of course, we're going to bring in our second and final guest. But just before we get on to him, it's time to say goodbye to our special guest. He's not even a guest. He actually joined me. He's, he's been part of the panel this week. He's done he's done me proud, Eddie Chambers. So I just want to thank you, Eddie, um, for, for coming on the show, for, for helping me out, for uh, taking I as his place. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, man. It's been it's been great working with you on on this week's show. Oh, you know I did, man. You know I like to, I, I I like to talk anyway. I got a big mouth and I run my mouth all the time. Not necessarily in a bad way, but you know I like to talk. So this was not this is actually a good thing, man. I hope to do it again soon. Absolutely, man. You're welcome back whenever. And just before I let you go, Eddie, um, just for the listeners that 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 uh, that are interested. Um, when 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 are we likely to hear what's next for you? When are we likely to hear some kind of announcement? I know that you said that you're you know sort of looking at going at cruiserweight. Have we got any idea of a return of you to the ring? Any any kind of idea when that when that's likely to be? 
Well, I mean, I was initially thinking earlier this year. You know, what I mean, you know, at the turn of the year, I was going to be, you know, starting that. But I'm, um, I'm going to be training, and we're just going to let, you know, let, let it happen when it's ready. You know what I mean? I'm going to be in the gym, and you know, continuously, you know, getting my, uh, my body right, and like I said, coming down and waiting, making sure I'm in the, you know, not coming down and waiting, not rushing, just letting it kind of happen. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to really put a time on it now. You know, what I mean, I'm just going to, like I said, let it happen, and it'll probably be you know, closer to the mid, probably toward the end of the year now. You know what I mean? I got a few things working and uh, a few things I got to focus on, you know, until then. So I'm going to let that happen probably toward the end of the year more so than, you know, than what I was thinking before. But you never know. It all depends on what pops up. Absolutely. Well, like I said, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Now, before we end part two and essentially end the show, there's one last thing to do. And I said it a minute ago and I'm saying it again. It's, of course, to welcome our second and final guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the hard-hitting middleweight from Cork, Ireland, Spike O'Sullivan. Spike, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Joy. Uh, good, good to speak to you again. Hey, it's always my pleasure, Spike. Now, Spike, it's just been announced that you're fighting on the 18th of this month, so in just 16 days' time, up in Boston, USA. Uh, you're taking on a man called Ronald Montez. Looking at his record, he you know, he seems to be a man that stops people or gets stopped himself. A lot of knockouts uh, when you look at his, his resume. Do you know anything else about him at all, Spike? Um, I've watched a bit on YouTube of him, yeah, but I don't know much else than everybody else could find it on the internet really to be honest uh, obviously I've seen his record on Box Rec and a couple of his fights on YouTube and he was thinking he's a bit of a puncher and uh, he's kind of you know he, he was in all or nothing so uh, I think it'd be a nice, pretty exciting fight for the fans and uh, you know, end up getting involved to it yeah, I know that that's the type of opponent that you like to fight as well. Those guys that can bang a little bit, you like to test yourself a bit. Um, Spike, how has camp been so far, by the way? Yeah, it's been good, you know. Uh, putting in hard work and plenty of sparring just going sparring there in the next 20 minutes, actually. be uh, one of my last bars before the fight. Um, but camp's been going good, you yeah, have been putting hard work in. And um, when did you fly out to the US, Spike? Well, I'm going to fly out um, just a couple of days prior to the fight. Uh, it's my ninth fight in the US. Uh, I'm pretty used to being uh, acclimatised over there, and I know I know that my surroundings. I'm, I fought in the, the same arena twice before, so it's my third fight at arena. But I know it quite well, and uh, I'm going to train up right up to the fight and just fly over a couple of days prior to the fight. And this might sound a little bit silly, but obviously you said there you fought in the US a number of times. You fought in the state of Massachusetts a lot. Why always in Massachusetts? What's what's the big draw there? I can't understand it. There's a big um, Irish community, big uh, American Irish community there, and uh, I got a lot of support there, and uh, sell a lot of tickets, from, you know, just about putting bums on seats, and you know, uh, my promoter Ken Casey of Murphy's uh, often uh, they like to have me fight out there. Uh, the crowds come to see me out there and that's, that's why I keep on going back it's great and the people you know are great there and it's great there to fight good stuff and Spike any idea when you're going to be fighting next in the UK I know someone asked you this on Twitter the other day I know that you uh, you know you want that to happen pretty soon any idea when that's likely to happen because we're dying to see you again I've absolutely no idea to be honest uh, <laughs> when I'm going to fight in the UK again I'm promoted by an American promoter but I love fighting in the UK fans are great there and uh, I, just, I do love fighting there but uh, I just don't know when the, when the next fight's going to occur or go go if uh, he hadn't been beaten by Craig Cunningham but uh, you know, that fight looks very late you know and, uh, unfortunately but I thought I'm not really sure to be honest because obviously you had your, you, you know, you had your eye on Eubank Junior. You were sort of trolling him a little bit. Then, then like you say, you had your eyes on Anthony Agogo. Do you still fancy that Agogo fight? Is he still someone on your radar? Of you, or have you got your eye on anyone else, Spike? Well, yeah, I'd like to smash up Agogo right if I get the opportunity arose because uh, he let Max talk say about me, and uh, I'd never turned down the opportunity to beat him up if I got the got the chance. Okay. Um, I want to go back a couple of weeks now. What did you make of Chris Eubank Jr.'s win over Reynold Quinlan? And do you recognise Chris Eubank Jr. as a legitimate world champion? Well, um, I think Ronald was uh, tougher than people thought. I didn't know much about him prior to that fight. I think he put up a pretty good performance. And, you know, I, I suppose I do uh, recognise the IBO because um, <clears throat> Gennady Glaskin is the uh, middleweight IBO champion and has been the previous champion, I think, Floyd Mayweather and... Uh, and several other players I can't remember more off the, off the top of my head but when I look at 
the IBO title brought more attention when you like was waiting for it to me and uh, I think there's a lot of very good fighters have previously been IBO champion and I've today I think Lofkin is a currently the middleweight IBO champion so I, I, I'd be like to recognise it as a world title myself yeah, personally OK fair point um, I want to ask you now about a couple of a couple of upcoming fights Spike just to uh just just coming to the end of the last couple of questions now. Uh, this weekend, obviously, a mammoth fight in, 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 in the UK. Uh, Hay against Bellew. How do you see that one playing out, Spike? Uh, it's hard to say. You know, I think it, it, in form or form, David Hay would have been a, my favourite for a, a knockout if he can you know, get that form that he had of old. But he's been out of the ring yeah, for a long time, really. He'd had two fights after the Cesaro fight would be the last fight I'd consider a real fight. It was with Cesaro, two fights that he'd had prior to this have been nothing more than a, you know, a glamorous barn session, you know, with a rubbish opponent, really, I think, you know. So, uh, I bet he was a bit more active. It's going to be an interesting fight, but I, I believe towards David Hayes, I think. Yeah, bigger, I think. I think he's naturally bigger. The, the only uh, thing is the inactivity, but I think... The, I do think Tony Bellew has got some psychologically. I haven't seen David Hay really being as, you know, he, he looks upset and really annoyed. I know I've seen him talk and trash with Klitschko and before and all that, but it just seems a bit more different than he seems a genuine uh, fight. And uh, I think that mightn't be the best way to go into fight, I don't think. Uh, no, but I do think he probably will win. Yeah, I think, like I say, I think most people agree with that, with, with that outcome. Um Two more fights I want to ask you about now. Sorry, go on. They, and they have sparred as well before. They have sparred before Bellew and Hayes. So, you know, I don't know if, there's, if, if Bellew taking something from that and he, he has confidence in the sparrows. I, I don't know, it's hard to read into it. I just don't know. But I, I say if I had to pick, put a bet on, I'd probably put it on David Hayes. Yeah. Um, this fight I want to ask you about, I wasn't actually going to ask you until... Um, well, it's it's just been announced sort of this week. It's one obviously in the middleweight division. It's a fight which I got to be honest, I'm not overly looking forward to. I don't think it's a brilliant fight, but it, you know it's big news at the minute, I suppose. So I thought I'd get your opinion. Martin Murray against Gabriel Rosado. Any opinion on that? Well, um, I think they deserve to have this fight. I think they both probably make quite decent money out of it. There are two warriors that have provided a lot of entertainment to me as a boxing fan and to everybody else over the years. And, you know, they both, I think I suppose, better shots for world titles. I think it'll be, it could be a good, could be a good fight at two Warriors and uh, I suppose on the night, like, you know, it depends. But yeah, I, I think it could be a good fight, to be honest. I think, you know, the, the, the two Warriors, as I say, and uh, I think they deserve the fight. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we see it. I think both guys are kind of, even though, like, yeah, they've got that warrior status against guys who, you know, against animals, really. We've seen, uh, you know, seen Martin Murray in a few people's backyards, but he's not really an aggressive yeah. fighter. And same for Rosado. I think he's not really aggressive. I think they're both warriors, but they're both not too aggressive for yeah. me. I think so, they're both a bit negative, you know? Yeah, they're coming from, yeah. 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 They are too good I wouldn't take that away from them. Yeah, no, no, of course not. And finally, Spike, the last question I've got for you now, one that I know that you, uh, you've you definitely got an opinion on, Gennady Golovkin against Danny Jacobs, arguably the, uh, the well, not, yeah, the most 50-50 fight that can be made in the middleweight division, arguably. Uh, obviously, we don't really yeah. see it as a 50-50. Most people sort of 60-40, maybe even 70-30 in favour of Golovkin. How do you see it, Spike? I, th- I think it's a great fight. Uh, it's one I'm really looking forward to. I'm going to fight on the same night, actually, just four hours away in uh, Boston on the same night where they're fighting in New York. Um, I think Danny Jacobs has the uh, boxing ability, the speed and the power of the Golovkin problems because I think Kell Brook caused Golovkin problems and uh, I think Danny Jacobs is like a bigger version of Kell Brook. Okay, so you're predicting Danny Jacobs to win that fight, yeah? Mm, yeah, I, th- I think he, he has the chance. Definitely going to be a knockout either way, like like the like the Bellu here fight, and like Lofkin Jacobs. I think you know it's a possibility of going either way, but I'd be, you know, I I think Lofkin could knock Jacobs out like Pirog did, but uh, I think Lofkin's there to be. Danny Jacobs is a very good box. I think he's in with a very good chance. I wouldn't be one bit surprised to be knocked out Lofkin out. Well, what an intriguing fight. We'll have to wait and see for sure. Yeah, that's really it, Spike. So, uh, like I say, it's my pleasure having you on, as always. Thank you for coming on at such short notice as well. Best of luck for the 18th, and we'll speak sometime after for sure, my friend. Thanks for having me on, and uh, speak to you again soon. Take care.
Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 72 of the Box Hard Podcast. It's been a special show. It's had a different feel this week. It's been informative, but most of all, it has been fun. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been Eddie Chambers. He was spot on. Thank you to our two special guests on this week's show, Jonathan Banks and Spike O'Sullivan. It's a huge week of boxing, and I hope that listening to this show has just whetted your appetite just a little bit for what's in store on Saturday night. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thank you for downloading it. We'll be back next week with another big show as per usual. Until next time, take care.